What does that music do to me and to others? Paul refers to three types of music, as he said. The Psalms uh, that he refers to were music with instrumental accomplishment, accompaniment, and referred to the Old Testament Psalms familiar in the Jewish worship, in the Christian community, beginning for mostly Jews, uh, and they continued in that tradition of the song being very important. The hymn is purely vocal music directed to praise of God and the newer utterances of the Christian experience. Then we have this interesting phrase, spiritual songs, spiritual songs, and the Greek word is ode, ode, and it's more difficult to interpret. The use of ode or lyric poetry might describe more varied or elaborate music sung by one person, a spiritual utterance of one for the benefit of the whole congregation. We're going to have that a little bit later on. We're going to have some soloists singing for us for our benefit. And that, again, that is an important concept. Spiritual old, relating to spiritual things, is in contradistinction from those which were sung in places of revelry. Remember the context in which this scripture was written. It was written to the believers at Ephesus. And Ephesus was the seat of the worship of Diana uh, and others. The festival of uh, Dionysius as well as Diana were common to the Ephesians. My wife and I had the opportunity to, to visit Ephesus uh, on our tour of Asia Minor in scripture but modern day Turkey. Um, and it's fascinating, fascinating city. The prominence of the uh, <clears throat> of the honor of uh, Diana is there. Anyway, at, in the worship or the festivals of these, um, the music and dance coupled with drinking wine in excess was intended to fill the participants with the spirit of that God. Probably some Christians might want to join that particular church, huh? uh, drinking wine in excess. And, and anyway, but hence Paul's admonition to not be filled with wine where it is excess, but to be filled with the spirit of God and speak with one another in spiritual hope. Music was an important part of the early Christian experience and services, and it still is today. Music. I don't know if you've ever been to a service without music. I think it would be pretty heavy. I'm not sure I would enjoy it that much. Because, why? Because music engages our souls. Music, the language of the soul. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And I would suppose that even then, people had preference of one type over another. Do you have a preference of the kind of music you like in church? I mean, in this church, I know classical is very, very important. Um, and uh, I don't know if you thought, uh, yeah, I'm sure it's spirituals. If some of spirituals, uh, Praise songs. Praise songs. I was talking with Mark about the praise songs. It's a, a new fad in the church, I guess. Um, how many of you are for praise songs? Don't don't raise your hand. Don't want you to sing with about but just think about it. Um, I, when I was growing up, I grew up in a small Welsh Baptist church in Pennsylvania. And the Welsh are really into music. I was telling the Mark, I think it was Mark, uh, my home church, I asked him how you're singing as a congregation play, because my home church, we a small Baptist church, there's only about 20, 30 people, members, uh, 
uh, and they were all there on Sunday for the most part, and a couple of visitors, but the hymns were all sung in parts. All the congregation, the men sang tenor or bass, the women sang soprano, alto. We had parts. That's the way I grew up. As soon as my voice changed, tenor taught me how to sing the tenor part. So whenever I sing hymns, I sing the tenor. Um, not from the book at all, because I'm leading, so I have to sing the melody. But um, I guess the, the important part was that people were engaged in the music. Engaged in the music. Very important. Be that way. Um, and in those days we had hymns and what were called gospel songs. Okay? The hymns were praise to God and the gospel songs were my experience with God, basically. And then later we had other things added as we came on down through the, through the years, uh, through the present moment, where there's all kinds of different music in the Christian church, and you might have a preference of one over the other. Three, um, I, I read one in an article one time, and I did not write down the source, but it, the article referred to five worship hymn styles, five worship hymn styles, and proposed that more than any other uh, single factor, ready for this? The year you were born determined the hymn style that you like. I found that interesting. And I found it especially interesting when I read where I fit into this type of case. Um, I happen to like some of each style. You might wonder what they are and I'm going to tell you in a minute. The great classic hymns written between 1520 and 1870. 15, 20, and 18. Now, I don't think any of you were born then. I may be wrong. Uh, these hymns, examples. A mighty fortress is our God. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. The church is one foundation. These are old hymns of churches that were written before 1870. American Protestants born between, ready? 1927. And 1945, this article said, prefers this type of hymn. So if you're in that age group, 1927 to 1945, you prefer the classic hymns. Those born before 1927, if they're still around, seem to prefer the old gospel hymns, written between 1870 and 1935. Things like Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, In the Garden, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Well, whatever style this music is, it is to help us sing and make music in our hearts to God. Always giving thanks with melody in the heart. Melody. By the way, if, if you wonder where the other three categories of hymns are, I lost the sheet that I hadn't written on. <laughs> so, they weren't important anyway because these are the ones that we want to deal with. <laughs> okay, melody. Now, I, I told Alan if I say anything that is inaccurate in the music area today, that he can correct me afterwards. <laughs> And he gave me, he gave me a blanket uh, forgiveness. A uh, melody is an agreeable succession of sounds so regulated and modulated as to please the ear. It differs from harmony, which we also need in the church, by the way, but that is for another time. Harmony in the church, when we're singing, not just solos, but we singing together harmony. The word Paul uses for melody or, or music means to touch or pluck, to twang a string, as the string of a bow and then the string of an instrument of music. And it is used only three other times in the New Testament, each being translated sing. The idea here 
is that of singing in the heart or praising God from the heart. Our hearts are to be engaged in the music or external performance. We are to get into the worship of God. Then this key phrase, giving thanks always for all things. We should sense always internally the mercy and goodness of God. One of our problems in the church is that we sometimes get to thinking about what we want and what we, we, we think things should be. And we, we, we don't communicate properly with one another sometimes uh, so that we might all benefit in this. And as I said last week, the key part of communication is the listening, listening with understanding, then we can begin to communicate with one another. And Paul is using music as the means by which we can communicate. We are in our melodies of our hearts to give thanks to God for all things and for all persons. We are to regard ourselves under obligation to give thanks for the mercies bestowed upon the human race for the happiness which we are permitted to enjoy. Music, your individual personal music in your heart. And then as we bring that into the church experience, how we relate to one another, always giving thanks to God. God is the focal point of our worship, not us or our ideas. God 